Season 3 of Star Trek The Original Series is hailed by most as the worst of the original run. And while there are certainly some gems in the season, overall it is jam-packed with lackluster and just downright horrible episodes. Most people consider The Way to Eden a fall smack dab into the horribly bad category. I, however, do not. Its absolute silliness has endeared me to this kooky story. And today, we're going to take a look behind the scenes on the making of this cult classic legend. Hello and welcome to Backtrack, a web series that focuses on the background information on any given topic in Star Trek. In this episode, we're taking a look at the Star Trek The Original Series episode The Way to Eden to better understand its place in Star Trek history. When most fans are listing off the worst episodes of the original series of Star Trek, they tend to start off with Spock's brain, and then list this one as second place, The Way to Eden. But this is something I've always disagreed with. No one can deny how crazy and ridiculous both this episode and Spock's brain really are, but rather I submit to you, good trinaries, that it is its silliness that makes it such a wonderfully fun episode. Now, before you start calling me Herbert, let's get down to some of the basic behind-the-scenes information. The Way to Eden was originally written by none other than Dorothy D.C. Fontana herself, and the story we got was very different from the original story that D.C. had written. Originally titled Joanna, the story was to revolve around McCoy's daughter, named Joanna, and her involvement in this hippie cult that was seeking a mythical planet said to be Paradise Incarnate. And during the episode, Captain James T. Kirk would fall in love with Joanna, and vice versa, with the intent that Joanna would appear in Season 4 to sort of continue that love story. Fred Freiberger, who took over the show as showrunner, after Gene Roddenberry stepped aside from the show collecting his paycheck as an executive producer, but having very little to do with the actual show itself, didn't like DC's story outline and made several changes to it, bringing it more in line with what we finally got to see. Arthur Heinemann would take DC's story outline and Freiberger's changes and write the first and second drafts of the script, removing Joanna McCoy and replacing her with Irina and adding her as a love interest for Chekhov rather than Kirk. Focus in the story would also change from the now Irina character to that of the Space Hippies leader, Dr. Severin, and the Hippie Bunch's search for Eden. After a few more rewrites by various people, Freiberger himself would take over the script, pumping out the final draft that would be filmed. After reading the script, DC Fontana was extremely unhappy with it, as it bore virtually no resemblance to her original idea, and as a result, DC would pull her name from the credits for this episode, opting instead to use her pseudonym, Michael Richards. As a result of the rewriting, at times the episode does seem disconnected. Take a look at Chekhov for example. Because the original story had called for Kirk to be in that role, suddenly we have a very rigid, very rule-quoting, straight-arrow type of character, something which really went against the very core of who Chekhov was, and had always been conceived to be. And Walter Koenig himself would often quote this episode as one of his least favorites because of how badly written Chekhov was in it, and how The Way to Eden was one of those lowest points in his career. This episode would also mark the first time we hear Pavel Chekhov's middle name, which is Andreevich. A little bit of Trek trivia for you all here is that not only was the episode considered badly written, but it was also badly filmed. Many times, it was discovered by the editors of this episode that the required reaction shots simply weren't filmed. As a result, if you look closely, you can see where these missing shots are as the editors were forced to insert previously used shots printed backwards to make them appear new. Skip Holmier, who played Malakon in the Season 2 episode Patterns of Force, would return to Star Trek in this episode as Dr. Severin. Skip had a wide and varied acting career, being in shows such as Lost in Space, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and Fantasy Island. He retired from acting in 1982, 
and died on June 25, 2017. Charles Napier would play Adam in this episode. For years, his face bothered me, as I kept thinking I know him from somewhere, but couldn't figure out how, until one day I realized he had returned to Star Trek decades later to play the role of Lieutenant General Denning in the Deep Space Nine Season 4 episode, Little Green Men. Napier actually wrote the songs featured in The Way to Eden, together with Craig Robertson and Arthur Heinemann, the latter providing the lyrics. Napier also performed the vocals for all these songs, which I find to be absolutely amazing and delightful. He also had a wide and varied extensive acting career, but unfortunately, on October 3rd, 2011, Napier collapsed in his home. He was found the following morning and taken to Memorial Hospital in Bakersfield, California, but nothing could be done. He was taken off life support just before 1 p.m. on October 5th and died shortly thereafter. He was 75 years old. Mary Linda Rapalier would guest star as Chekhov's love interest, Irina. Mary also had a long and extensive acting career, appearing in many miniseries and soap opera roles. In 2006, she would return to the world of Star Trek, playing Ambassador Raina Morgan in the fan production Star Trek New Voyages. She guest starred in the episode To Serve All My Days, alongside her The Way to Eden co-star Walter Koenig. Another bit of Trek trivia for you all occurs in the scene in which Spock plays his Vulcan harp for Adam. Listen carefully to the music playing in the background, as it's the exact same music, merely recycled, from Uhura's song in Charlie X. Another recycled bit is the collapse of Nurse Chapel as well as the collapse of a bunch of other crew members in the corridor. This is reused footage from Spock's brain, which explains why the lights go out in sickbay during that shot, while they are functioning normally everywhere else on the ship. One thing that always struck me as odd about this episode, as if the episode itself wasn't really odd to begin with, was the use of the name Herbert as an insult. After doing a lot of digging and discussing this topic with a bunch of people involved in the production of Star Trek, it seems there was a very targeted reason as to why the name Herbert was used. You see, Herbert Solo, who was the studio executive serving originally on behalf of Desilu Studios for the first and second seasons, left under less than amicable circumstances before season three began, and was very disliked by his successor, Douglas S. Kramer, who demanded the insult be Herbert as a dig against Solo. In later years, Kramer would deny this being the case, stating that he actually had been referring to Herbert Hoover instead of Solo. Which version is the truth, I don't know, but I tend to believe it's the former rather than the latter. This episode was also very makeup intensive, and as a result, Paramount had to hire outside makeup artists to assist with the episode. Ohura would also not appear in this episode, being replaced with Elizabeth Rogers, who would reprise her role as Lieutenant Palmer first seen in the Season 2 episode, The Doomsday Machine. In the original version of this episode, the spacecraft Aurora is actually a Tholian starship model from the Tholian web, with AMT Enterprise model kit nacelles attached to it. However, for the remastered version of this episode, an entirely new design would be created. Though not directly connected to Star Trek V The Final Frontier, this episode does have threads that seem to be connected. The main one being Spock's desire to find Eden. Of course, this is probably just coincidence, but if you take Star Trek V into account while watching this episode, it actually gives Spock's motivation more credence, as it could have been Cybok's influence that would spark Spock to keep an open mind in regards to Ultimate Paradise. As previously stated, this episode has never been well received by the fan base, and most newer Star Trek fans when watching this, well, they don't have very many nice things to say about it. Nevertheless, I like it. The campiness of the episode always draws me in and makes me smile quite a bit. At times, I even find myself humming heading out to Eden when I'm doing the most mundane of tasks. And whether you enjoy this episode or despise it, one thing is certain, 
it is definitely a really different type of Star Trek episode. And that alone has earned this episode its place in Star Trek history. What is it? The flower, sir. I touched it. It's like fire. Aurora, cut power. You are overtaxing your ship. Explosion is imminent. You've caused an interstellar incident which may have destroyed everything that's been negotiated. You've got a hard lip, Herbert. What is your destination? The planet Eden. Then why did you stay away? Because you disapproved of me. How do you know what I want? You're young. Come, join us. You make it tempting. Dr. Severin is insane. Captain, it seems as though someone else is running the ship. That's right. Someone else is running this ship. I am. <laughs> Thank you for watching today's episode of Backtrack. What do you think of The Way to Eden? Would you rate it as one of the worst Star Trek The Original Series episodes of all time? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting the little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel head out to Eden? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and remember, I reach you. Herbert, 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 Herbert,